Hi. 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 I'm internet sensation and teen heartthrob, George. <laughs> Uh, I want to start uh, in uh, Venetia, California, uh, which is a li little city by California standards of about 27,000 people. Uh, there are 10,000 businesses and residents. And in each of those 10,000 businesses and residents is a water meter. And that water meter uh, measures the flow of water that is used. And in California, water is a very precious piece of equipment. And so the, uh, uh, what's interesting about the water meters is that Venetia did an experiment a few years ago where they looked at how accurate the water meters were. So they did a random sampling and they pulled them out of the out of the business and houses that they were in and they plugged them into these devices and they found that there was a huge range in accuracy that went from about 70% down to zero. Zero percent meant that none of the time the meter was actually measuring accurately what the water flow was. And for the town of Benicia, which has a very high cost of water, not collecting the right amount of money for water usage, not knowing what the water is, not being able to report this, turned out to be a big deal. So they decided they were going to replace the whole set of meters, many of which had been installed uh, decades before. And the company that won the bid for the meters was a company called Neptune uh, Technologies. Neptune Technologies made this meter back in the 50s. They've been making water meters since 1886. And for the most part, those water meters were uh, basically a, a mechanical deal. They, they were uh, based on fluid engineering, mechanical engineering. The company also had that little bit of expertise in manufacturing engineering. And that was pretty much the technical side of the company. But when Benicia reached out to them, they moved beyond that. They actually have created a whole new line of water meters. And this line of water meters is ultrasonic. It has no moving parts. Its accuracy is far better than the best water meters they'd ever put out that were mechanical. And more importantly, these things have computers in them. They not only can measure the water, but they can report it back to the water readers. Uh, this particular model, the Mach 1, has a, the capability of communicating via uh, a, a, an LTE communication line, right? Basically, it's got a little cell phone in it. And it talks to the water department. The city of Benicia had 17 uh, people whose job it was to go from house to house, from business to business, to read all the meters, and as soon as they were done with their routes doing the whole area, they would just start over and do it again. They'd get through a sequence about once every three months. Now, they can read every meter with the push of a button. The Internet of Things has hit water meters. For those of you who don't know, Internet of Things is basically someone else's computer in your house. <laughs> and. In order to make this work, they had to create software. They had to create um, uh, all sorts of uh, applications. There are applications for the city. There are applications for the home or business owner. You can actually see how much water you use in real time. It will tell you if you've left a hose on that you didn't expect. It, 
uh, uh, it's a fairly sophisticated system. And it completely exists with, uh, uh, with software. And so now, the folks at Neptune have to have skills in electrical engineering, in software development, in network capability, in user interface engineering, in user experience design, in service design, because they create large service networks. The software that they build is used by cities the size of uh, uh, Venetia and by cities the size of LA County, which has 58 million people. So they have to be able to, to scale across all of that. And they need design leadership. And this is the thing. For a hundred and they've been in business for 133 years. And for most of that time, they thought of themselves as somebody who made a mechanical device. And now suddenly they are in the computer business, they're in the software business, and they have to produce products that are well designed. And that design requires an understanding of UX design. And this is the problem that they face. Now, Neptune has about 250 employees. And the way that they pay those employees is uh, uh, through a uh, uh, a, a payroll system, a software system that they use to uh, uh, to be able to to deal with the complexity of the uh, of of handling that type of staffing. Now Neptune is in Tulasi, uh, Alabama, and they are Tallahassee, I'm sorry, Tallahassee, Alabama. I'm going to get that right eventually. They are in Tallahassee, Alabama. Tallahassee, Alabama is about two hours away from Atlanta. And so it's not a particularly uh, technical part of the world. They end up dealing uh, for payroll. For many years, they used a company called ADP. The problem is, is that now they are scaling up and they're thinking about what they're going to do, and they're considering some competitors like Gusto. Gusto is a small $4 billion company, and they make this really easy to use payroll system. And that has put sugars down ADP's spine, because ADP, which is a $58 billion company, they have never really thought about having software that was easy to use. They were just a payroll service. In fact, the way ADP worked was that most of the time, a company like Neptune wouldn't go to ADP directly. They'd hire some intermediary consulting agency that would do payroll services for them because ADP software was so difficult to use, you had to hire a company to use it for them. <laughs> And then, in order to work with that intermediary company, you had to train your HR people to fill out the right forms and use the right thing, uh, 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 software to be able to give that payroll company the information they needed. Gusto makes all of that go away. So suddenly, Neptune doesn't need as many HR people as they used to have, even though they're hiring more employees. And ADP is struggling. So at the same time, they are finding that they have to hire people to make their software easier. So on the one hand, we have companies like Neptune, which are dealing with the change in their industry that is pushing them to have more software, more user interfaces in it. And we're seeing companies like ADP which are dealing with the change in their industry that is forcing them to think more about better service delivery, better design, by actually having less software, less user interfaces. And in both cases, 
User experience design is playing a key role. Both companies are gearing up huge user experience teams. AP is in Rosedale, New Jersey. There's a decent but not large amount of UX people. They can pull from the greater New York and Philadelphia regions, but it's still hard to get people to want to work in Rosedale. <laughs> Neptune's in Towsie, Alabama, and uh, uh, they, uh, there's no U.S. people there. Uh, you can walk for a long distance before you bump into someone who even knows what you is. <laughs> so here we are with this struggle of how do they actually get the staff that they need. And the problem that they have is that their futures depend on having great design. At this point, it turns out that great design is what's going to give them a competitive advantage. If they don't pay attention to the user experiences of the products and services that they deliver, they will fail. And of course, these aren't the only two companies going through this. Every company in every industry is going through this. We used to think of uh, UX as being primarily a tech industry job. It is now in every industry. And it's not just human business. We see large numbers of universities hiring UXers, we see nonprofits hiring UXers, and I spent a year in the White House helping them hire UXers. And so this turns out to be a huge, huge issue because, frankly, there are not enough designers for all the organizations that want them today. So this is creating a problem of us just not being able to fill the demand that we have. What's happening is that every organization is competing for the same pool of people. And the amount of slack that we used to have is no longer there. This is creating a problem for us. For Neptune, the better that their product is, the more likely they're going to get sales like Benicio, California. For ADP, the easier their product is to use, the more it reduces the burden on the organization, the more likely they're going to get companies like Neptune to buy their product. The quality of the product is determining whether people are going to buy it. There are only two ways that companies can compete. They can either compete on cost or on quality. Cost is simple. Cost, the, the deal with cost is you just make sure that your margin, your product margin, is lower than ever, or higher than everybody else's. Your underlying costs are lower than everybody else's, right? As long as you keep your manufacturing or your delivery costs as low as possible, you can keep lowering your prices to below what everybody else's costs are, to the point where you are selling things profitably, but they can't, then they eventually have to pull out of business and then you can raise your prices again. This is how Walmart has succeeded for so many years. But that's cost. The alternative is you sell on quality. And when you sell on quality, you actually can charge more money and you can have your cost be higher. The problem with selling on cost is that it's a floor. But there's no ceiling to quality. And so being able to sell for a uh, uh, 
sell on a quality experience is absolutely key. And for these businesses where quality is determined by the user experience, what that means is that quality is actually directly correlated to the organization's UX capability. The better the organization is at producing great user experiences, the better the quality of the product will be. So capability is a direct driver of this. So they realized they need to hire great UX designers. There are only two ways to boost your capability. You either hire or you train. Training is definitely something that you have to do, but hiring is key, right? It's, it's really just a, a, an old traditional buy versus build model. Right? Do you take what you have and build it out, or do you buy some new talent? And that's what we're talking about. The other day I was talking to a senior vice president of a large software company. Uh, they have uh, 1,200 developers. And she has a team of 19 designers. And she would like to raise that to 125 by the end of this year. <laughs> And she called me up to ask me for advice, and the first words out of her mouth were, hiring UXers is fucking hard. <laughs> and that's how a lot of hiring design managers are feeling right now. It is just really hard to find folks. I was talking to a manager who has a, a, a large operation in Seattle. And they told me that in Seattle, the amount of time they have from when a candidate first comes on the market to they receive an offer from somebody is three days. Three days to go through the whole hiring process. If you take longer than three days, you will not get the decent candidates. They're gone. They're off the market. And so this turns out to be a huge, huge problem. That uh, uh, we don't have processes that help us get that done in three days. We have to make sure we don't give it out. Here's the thing. Nobody who goes to design school says, you know what I really want to work on when I graduate? Water meters. <laughs> you know what I want to work on? Payroll systems. That's how I'm going to contribute to the world. Right? No, nobody says that. But in fact, these companies have to attract really good designers, really good researchers, really good content people in order to make this work. They can't do anything else. So they have to provide opportunities. And they are competing directly against us. They are competing against all the jobs we want to hire them for. Right now, when we're talking about hiring, our competitors are not just the other companies in our industry. Our competitors are all the other industries. And this is what's making design so difficult for us. This creates another problem, which is we can't screw this up. If we let a good candidate, a candidate who could have done a great job for us, go because we don't have our hiring process, 
in place. We are sacrificing huge, because there just isn't a lot of spare candidates to fill that gap. So when uh, in April of 2015, I joined the Obama White House for, for a year to work on a problem. The problem was, was that the president, who had just started the U.S. Digital Service the previous October, had gotten the funding necessary from Congress, because in those days, presidents could do that. <laughs> To, uh, uh, to be able to grow the organization. Now, when the digital service first started, the team there thought it might max out at about 15, maybe 20 people. They didn't think it was going to be a big deal. After all, the folks who fixed healthcare.gov, that was a team of 13 people. So they thought, you know, how bad could this be? But it turned out as soon as the digital service started, they realized how many problems there were, just like healthcare.gov, and just how many issues there were. And they realized, wow, we need a lot more folks. So they went to work. They got Congress to put together this very innovative funding mechanism where the various agencies actually helped pay for, out of their own budgets, the digital service to expand. And then we, and then we were able to get permission to grow to 250 people. But the deal was, because back then we had budget periods, uh, uh, the deal was we had to have them all hired by October of 2015. So I was hired in uh, April to hire, basically, there were 23 people when I got there. So I had to hire basically 200, work with the team, the talent team, to hire 220 people to in the period of April to October. And we did it. But it was a tremendous amount of work. And we could not afford to let a candidate who was going to be able to do the job we needed, and we needed people who could do really amazing, technically hard work. We could not let them slip by. I was originally hired because the administrator at the time, Mikey Dickerson, uh, 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 had not actually ever met a living designer until he started the digital service. And even when I got there, there were three designers on the team. And uh, 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 he had no clue how to hire them. But it was pretty clear, actually, after we started, because he came from Google, that he actually had no idea how to hire developers or product managers or policy people. Either. And so we ended up expanding the program to hire all those folks. But the key thing was that we needed to have a hiring process that was going to succeed. And we looked at what was available, what was out there. And very quickly it was clear that almost every hiring process that people use is, in fact, just an act of sabotage. <laughs> it is just a, uh, a way that organizations try to really defeat their own purposes. And if you spend time, as we have, with people on the job market trying to get jobs, seasoned designers, brand new U.S. professionals to the field, you learn very quickly that the hiring process is actually not designed to hire people. <laughs> One candidate said, I met the team, it was pretty clear that they have no idea how to use someone just like me. Had another candidate, uh, a fairly senior uh, uh, U.S. person who was going for a leadership role, who was advertised clearly as a leadership role. She went in to interview a small company. She went in, her first interview was with the CEO. Yeah. The CEO uh, uh, told her that uh, he wanted her to set the strategy for how this product would be used, for the experience that it would have. 
he really wanted to think about the big, as particularly as they were growing, the, the big opportunities for hiring. She thought this was fantastic. Her next interview, minutes later, was with the head of product, who very quickly squashed the idea of strategy. Said, no, no, that's not what we need you to do. We need you to produce wireframes and workflow diagrams and flows. And what we need you to do is to, is to document all the specifics because we can't trust the developers to actually build anything on their own. So you have to specify everything out in exacerbated detail. And she walked out. She gave up. She went someplace else. She wasn't on the market long. She just gave up on them. They blew it. To this day, we actually don't know what they were hiring for. She never found out. Nobody seems to know. And this is a common problem. There are so many ways that we sabotage our own hiring process. We started to document the different ways, and it's huge. Uh, uh, people are, have interviews where interview after interview after interview, they ask the exact same questions, communicating to the candidate that there's, uh, uh, they don't talk to each other because they keep asking the same things. Uh, people go in, have a great set of interviews, and then never hear from a company again. The process has become known as ghosting. Uh, we see uh, problems where the company never gives a clue as to whether they're interested or not, and then months later says, we'd love to give you an offer, after di basically disappearing. Design exercises are particularly problematic. They eliminate large numbers of highly qualified people, particularly women and people of color. It's extremely a biased process. Anything involving an interview that looks for cultural fit has real serious issues. Uh, uh, we, we've had people tell us that they had to take psychological testing that had nothing to do with the job. That uh, there were requirements for years of experience for things like virtual reality. Like, you have to have seven to ten years of experience. <laughs> okay. You find that person. Uh, a hiring process where the top priority is to just get as many bodies and seats as possible. These are the types of things that get in the way. And these things are all uh, sabotage. We are basically incompetent at hiring, but the problem is we don't know we're incompetent. So we are unconsciously incompetent at our own hiring process. And this is problematic. I've had hiring managers defend the use of design exercises. Oh, I just want to see how the person thinks. Okay. A, you can't see how someone thinks. <laughs> you can see how they behave, but you can't see how they think. Okay. One hiring manager told me that their design exercise process was they like to actually tell them a brief that is not what they want and couldn't be done, and see if the person questions the brief. I want to see if, they're, if they have, I have the gumption to question me. Well, there are entire swaths of humanity which are taught the manners and respect to never question someone of authority, especially a stranger. So they will never raise an objection, even though they are probably in awesome designer and could do the job very well. Is that the type of company that you're, is that the way the work goes there? Right? 
The other one is that they'll come in and they'll, you know, people say, well, we do a design exercise. Would you give them any warning that you're going to do this? No, we want them to see how they think on their feet. Yeah. So, the way you do work at your operation is basically you call people into a conference room filled with strangers and you ask them to design something in 15 minutes on their feet. Is that how you do work? Because that's the message you're sending. This is how we do work here. All of this is thought to reveal what the talents of the candidate are when in fact they are actually pushing away the best candidates. The worst of it is giving a design exercise for what would be a junior designer to someone who's fairly senior. That immediately communicates that these people don't actually know what I would do. And so this is all a problem. We have to rethink the way we do hiring. It's not just design exercises. It's all the aspects of it. We have to treat hiring as if it's a service design problem, because it is a service design problem. From the moment they first hear about us, through the moment we make the offer, and beyond, till they're onboarded, till they're in their job, till they're actually working for there for months, because retention is also key, we have to think about the process. We have to think about the steps that we go through. And to understand what it is that we are trying to accomplish. This is our biggest challenge right now, is actually understanding how to hire, because we have to compete against the Neptunes and the ADPs. If they figure this out before us, they will get the best candidates. Now there's an additional problem. Almost all hiring is designed for what are called active candidates. Active candidates are a lovely group of people. They are like the folks who raised their hand earlier tonight and said, I'm looking for a job. Active candidates are people who are actively looking. They have prepared their resume. They may have even done a portfolio. They are looking at all the different job opportunities. They are considering every single one. And they're really working hard to find work. But it turns out that there are tons of highly qualified candidates who are not currently looking for work. They are actually happy in their job. They are paid very well. They are given great benefits. And more importantly, they're given challenging work to do. But if that right opportunity happened, if that right uh, position opened up, they would jump. But they're not looking. So that means that they need different information. At the beginning of this meeting, a bunch of people stood up and said, I have two designer positions. I have three designer positions. Right? Nobody said what those positions would actually do. It turns out that this is a huge problem. We advertise by generic ads. We, we create the same titles for hiring designer, and then under that, beneath that, we put the exact same text. Our company is a leading class company that's producing state-of-the-art stuff. You will work on amazing products that will delight our customers. <laughs> Responsibilities, designing good things, <laughs> working with teams, communicating effectively, requirements, 750 years of experience, <laughs> doing design, must have a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD in some science, or equivalent. Every ad is the same. And if you think I'm exaggerating, <laughs> I've been collecting ads, and one day I noticed 
that five of the ads in my collection not only had the same descriptions, but they had the same typos in those descriptions. <laughs> now, the reason for this is actually quite clear. Hiring managers discovering that they have a wreck, an opening, knowing that the opportunity to fill that opening is a ticking time bomb in their organization because whoever granted them permission to expand their team could go out drinking one night and the next day take that privilege away because they had a bad night. And so they want to fill that opportunity as soon as possible. So what do they do? They grab any job ad. And if they don't have one of their own, they go to another company that seems to have a good ad and they just copy the text and they paste it. I don't know who started the series of ads with the same typo, but everybody else thought, well, that's a good typo. I'm going to run with it. <laughs> and so the outcome is that, uh, that the... Uh, uh, what we see is uh, uh, everybody's got basically the same ads. And they don't actually say what the job is. Now, for active candidates, this is not going to stop them from applying. Because basically, smart active candidates apply to anything they think they can do. It's a game of numbers. You apply to as many things as you can to try to get as many screening calls as you can to try and get as many interviews as you can. They work through the numbers. But those passive candidates, those candidates who are possibly really effective at their job, but not uh, uh, and really good, they could come in and they do a fantastic job for you, but they're not looking they're never going to see that ad. And even if they do, they're certainly not going to pay attention to it. They're not looking. And if the job says nothing about what the candidate will do, they have no interest in it. And even for active candidates, active candidates who might have the specific background you're looking for, a generic ad will not help them talk to you. They will not help them succeed at explaining to you why they would be good at the job. So you have no information coming in. You get this resume that just lists a lot of companies and some bullet points that have nothing to do with the things you need them to do. You get a portfolio, maybe, of case studies that has nothing to do with the things you're looking for them to do. What do you assess these people on? So you have to talk to every candidate. You have to figure out if they're qualified or not. The cost of this hiring is huge. If you are lucky, like we were at the White House, to get 2,000 applications for 250 positions, that's a lot of work to have to go through every single one. And so this is problematic. And the thing is, the things we're asking for in these job ads, they don't help us. When we say you need seven years of experience, what are we actually asking for? Are we asking for a, a candidate who has actually got experience that tells a story over those seven years of how they grew, how they got better every year, how they were able to take on more responsibility every year, how their skills were, allowed them to produce better results every year? Or are we talking about a candidate who has spent seven years at a job doing exactly the same thing, such that they have one year of experience they've repeated seven times. <laughs> the number of years is not what's interesting. What's interesting is, what was their vector of growth? How did they do better at every new project, at every new assignment, over that period, and across other jobs? That's the story we're interested in. If you can figure out where they started and where they are now, you can see where they'll be after they come work for you. So we need to look at that vector of growth. So that's a big problem. Another problem that we have is that we treat 
few extras as if they are interchangeable. We can slot anyone into the job. Okay. Imagine a company like ADP. ADP has 35 products, that, major products that they sell. That's 35 different teams. And they have three openings right now for a senior designer. Now, that sounds like if they could just get three senior designers, they could put them on those projects and they'd be fine. That's what they want. But that's not the way this works. That job at ADP, those three designer jobs, they're actually different. One of them is to roll out a design system across the 35 different products. Right? These products are actually, uh, uh, have, they have 3,000 developers working on these products. So this design system is going to be used by 3,000 folks on 35 products in seven different business units, in development offices, uh, in uh, 18 countries. This is a huge responsibility. The person who's going to have to roll this out has to have a lot of understanding as to what makes uh, a good design system. They have to understand not only how to do the component inventory and design what the design patterns are going to be and create the structure for that, but they're going to have to do a lot of politicking. These, these product teams are not going to adopt this thing without kicking and screaming, at least some of them won't. So they're going to have to figure out how to get them to do it. They're going to have to know, do they push it all out at once and hope everybody adopts it at one time? Or do they roll it out in stages and try and get some uh, champions and some wins so that they can then get some air cover from senior management that says, actually, this design system is actually making us money or saving us costs. We need to roll this thing out better. So this is, this is a huge responsibility. And someone who's, who, who they want to fill this position really needs to understand how to do all those things. But the second senior design position, the second senior design position is for their big product, the product that makes most of the money in the company. This is a product that's been around forever. It has a thousand screens. And... It's desktop only. They need to make it mobile for the first time. Their competitors have mobile solutions. It's not, it, they're not able to talk to that market. So how do you get a giant cash cow, highly politicized, thousand screen application to go mobile? The person who's gonna fill this job needs to have experience working at that scale, working at that pace, with that many people. The third senior designer, the third senior designer has to work with another team, a team that is smaller, but also is a huge margin, huge revenue generating product. And for years, because of the nature of this product, they never need to, to think about their users, ever. They just put this thing out because it's the only product of its kind who ever did this thing. The people just figured out how to use it. They just did it. But now, now they've got competitors. And the competitors have a better user experience because that wasn't hard. <laughs> Right? When you never think about your users coming up with a better user experience than that is usually pretty easy. So suddenly, this team wants to learn about their users, but they've never done it before. How do you help a team that's had, that's had a product on the market for almost 25 years that has never ever thought about users? How do you help them think about them for the first time? Now, here's the thing about these three senior designer positions. They are very specialized. Not specialized in the way we talk about specialized. They're not visual designer specialized or user research specialized. They're specialized in their knowledge to get these things shipped, to get these things developed. 
These are true specialists, not the fake ones we pretend we have. Right? And the thing about these designers is that if I had someone who was good at rolling out design systems on a large scale, and I stuck them in the mobile app job, they wouldn't do any better than if I just put a junior designer in that space. Their skills would not roll over. What has to happen here is the skills for each of these jobs has to be understood. We can't treat UXers as interchangeable because they are not. They are, in fact, very highly specialized. I'm going to guess that any of you who work in any industry for any amount of time, you've developed knowledge. Here we are in the lovely world of Simpress and Vistaprint. Uh, uh, this, the people who work in UX here have incredible knowledge about how things get printed. And it turns out that knowledge is really deep. Go down the road to Fidelity, they have incredible knowledge about the world of institutional and consumer finance. Those are not interchangeable sets of domains. And so we have to think about that type of knowledge. There's this theory floating around called the T-shaped person. The T-shaped person is this notion that you're deep in your knowledge of one thing, but you're light but broad in everything else. And then what we want to do is staff up a bunch of T-shaped people and have them uh, uh, be our design team. But that's not how it works. That actually isn't how people work, and it's not a good strategy. For one thing, it greatly limits you. One of the things we're seeing is that as design teams are growing, they start as a sort of centralized team. They're sort of an internal agency that does all the design. But eventually, they start to get embedded in the local teams. The teams want their own designers. And if you're a company like ADP, where you have 35 products, and some of those products have multiple teams because they're large. You're talking 50, 60 teams that need designers. You can't have a full complement of T-shaped people in each of those teams. At best, you're going to get one, maybe two, in each of those teams. And the thing is, is that real people are not T-shaped. They're broken comb-shaped. <laughs> they have lots of varying skills, some of which are domain-specific, some of which are design-specific, some of which are what we might call soft skills, though I don't use the term soft skills anymore because it turns out they're quite hard. <laughs> Uh, so I call them uh, interpersonal skills, so uh, tonight I learned that David Chisnell calls them power skills, and I'm going to steal that. Uh, I give it to you. There you go. And so this idea of having lots of skills, and, but a different understandings and depth, this is how people really are. And what we need to do when we're staffing is think in terms of how we're going to spread this knowledge across a team. So can we get different profiles of broken cones such that when we lay them all on top of each other, we have all the skills necessary to do the job that we need. And while people then aren't interchangeable, we can still take advantage of the fact that people have different skills. So as we're hiring, we need to think about this. And think about how can we get people who are different from all the other people we have. This is the opposite of what a lot of people mean when they say cultural fit, which basically is code for people who are just like me. <laughs> Um, another problem is the team itself has no 
shared understanding of the position that they're hiring for. We have these very specific jobs, and the team doesn't know. The hiring team doesn't know. This is what happened with that CEO and that head of product. They didn't each know what they were hiring for. And this happens all the time. I'm sure you've seen the experience of uh, uh, that hallway encounter that happens when someone says, Hey, Bill, I'm glad I bumped into you. i got a candidate coming in about 20 minutes. Would you be available to interview them? Because I, I need someone to interview them. And Bill is now interviewing someone for a position knows nothing about, doesn't understand what they're looking for, can't answer any of the candidate's questions, and just does a sort of generic set of philosophical question interviews. So how do you define design? <laughs> This is a real question. When you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, what do you see? <laughs> if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? These are all real questions. And the problem is these tell you nothing about whether the person could roll a design system out to 35 teams that are highly political. Doesn't give you a single piece of information that helps you. But what if you could get specific information? What if you could ask the questions that get you there? Let's start with, so tell me about a time you rolled out a design system. <laughs> How'd that go? How many teams were involved? How long did it take you? Who did you work with? Can you draw me an org chart? Can you actually show me who did what on the org chart? Who Did you roll it out at once? Did you do it in stages? Were all the teams in the same building, or were they spread out at all? We can start to ask all these questions. So let's go back to the org chart. Who was the most challenging person to work with? What made them challenging? What did you do to overcome that challenge? And there isn't any question you can't answer by just diving into a project, one project after another, to get the answers. And that turns out to be key. So not having this shared information is, is, is the problem. So we can fix this. We can start to get better quality products by hiring better. And to do that, we need to start treating hiring as if it's a UX problem. Right? We need to think of it as if it's a design problem. And so there's a bunch of sort of standard hiring tricks that you can see direct parallels to their design equivalents. One that I love Bef that we used at the White House. Before you write, write the job ad, before you have anybody come in to interview, the first thing you do is you write a thank you note. The thank you note is to your future employee a year after they started. And you're thanking that future employee for all the accomplishments that they had during that year and telling them all the ways those accomplishments benefited the organization. Now, it only takes about an hour or two, maybe, to write this document. Some teams do it as a group. It's the equivalent of a whiteboard sketch. Is this what we need? And you take that thank you note and you circulate it to anybody who's going to be interviewing the candidate or anybody who's going to be working with the new employee. And you say, what do you think? Would it be useful to have someone who did all these things? Is this a realistic set of things for them to do? And you'll get feedback. You'll get feedback like, I don't know, that's a lot to cram into a year. It's like, okay, 
let's cut it back. Or you'll get feedback like, wow, I didn't know we needed a person to do that, but now that you've told me what this is and what the benefit is, I so want this person. Right. Suddenly, we are getting all sorts of feedback about who we want to have there. And it only took us a couple of hours of work to get to this idea. From there, we work through a process where we figure out how will we tell if they can do the job. Again, we've not written the job ad yet. We've not had our first set of interviews. And we are discussing how are we going to know if these are the right people. This is because we teams typically get in the middle of hiring and they have no clue what good is, what a, a candidate who could do a good job is. And so what happens when you have that is you resort to what's called gladiator voting. <laughs> gladiator voting is, I love them. Or, oh, no, we can't hire this person. Right? Thumbs up, thumbs down. They live, they die. Gladiator voting. Right? So, Bill, what did you think of the candidate? I don't know. Didn't impress me. Okay. I guess we're not going to hire him. Because right. you don't impress Bill, you can't hire the person. Even though Bill didn't even know we were hiring until about 20 minutes ago. Right. That's the problem with Gladiator. Right? Here's what we had to do at the White House. We couldn't go through all 2,000 applications that had come in the night of the State of the Union address when the president happened to mention 42 minutes into the State of the Union address that, in fact, we were looking for the best designers and developers on the planet. 2,000 applications came that, that night. There was no way we could go through and look at every portfolio, look at every LinkedIn page, particularly for kind of because when you're in the White House, you can't actually get to LinkedIn. <laughs> you have to go home to do it. And so... True story. True story. <laughs> so we could not... We could not do that. So instead, uh, uh, we had to have criteria up front that said what made a good, a good designer for us. We had to know that our designers were different. We had to say, what would make a good researcher for us? We had to know that all our researchers would be doing different things. We have people out researching issues about uh, immigration. We have other people who are doing constant usability testing of the various systems that VA people use. Very different types of research. We had to know those things, and we had to understand what that was. And what we would do is we established a set of criteria criteria that would tell us, is this person the type of person we really want to hire? The way we get there is we start with that thank you note. We take the accomplishments on that thank you note and we translate it into a set of objectives in what we call a performance profile. The performance profile, whereas the thank you note is like three quarters of a page, the performance profile is a job description on steroids. It's like six or seven pages. And we did this for each of the people we had to hire into the White House. And the performance profile uh, has five parts. It has a basic summary of what the position is. It has the objectives, those accomplishments that they're going to have in more detail. It has uh, the structure of the organization, who they're going to report to, what part of the organization they're going to fit in. It has the situational needs and challenges. What is it that makes work unique and difficult here? Right? The fact that the White House was, it was you had to be 
uh, uh, able to step into an agency and work quite independently because there was no one who was going to manage you on a day-to-day -day basis. So you had to come from a background of being self-managed. You also had to deal with the fact that most technology in government is like stepping into a time travel device, and you are actually working on technology that was created in 1995, if you're lucky. And so you, these were the types of challenges that you had to work with. And then we have the basic requirements that are HR-related things, like for the digital services, you had to live in Washington, D.C. You had to uh, uh, be able to pass a drug test, even if you lived in a state that has legalized marijuana, it is still a federal crime, and you can't work in the White House uh, if you have, have uh, uh, failed a drug test to that effect. And so these were the types of details that were in this document. And then from there, we create the assessment criteria. And the assessment criteria is basically taking those objectives and those situational needs and assigning scores to them. What would an ideal candidate look like? Each quality that an ideal candidate would look like gets four points. So for instance, that design system position I was talking about, having built a component library for more than 10 or 15 apps, that would get you four points. If you'd only built a component library for two or three apps, we'll give you three points. We call that emergent. The four points we call proficient. If You've thought about design systems, maybe did one for a small app, you get two points. We call that adequate. And if you've read about design systems <laughs> and know the word, we call that minimal. That's one point. Oh, and by the way, we have another category for points. It's five points. It's called distinguished. If you've written a book on design systems and taught workshops on how to build them and built them in multiple organizations, We'll give you five points. And so now we have points, and we sit and we negotiate those points as a team. Who gets four points? Who gets three points? Who gets two points? But not with specific candidates, just in general for that position. And now we have a rating system. And the way this works is the first person to get the requisite number of four points across all the different things we're looking for, they get a job offer. We don't have to go through every resume. We don't have to talk to every candidate. We just take them in order. So as we're going through, we make an initial pass. Does their resume and portfolio suggest they get points in something? Sure, we'll start to assign them points. And then we'll say, OK, the people with the highest points after the first couple of days, they're the ones we're going to call first. They're the ones we're going to talk to. And we can get the best candidates early on. And that lets us do that. And once we have these documents, we can create the job ad. We can figure out what kind of questions we're going to interview them. We can give them a project to take home if we want to go that route. We can give them a, 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 a briefing about what they're going to actually be doing at the job. And we can figure out how to check references. All of the things fall into this because we have defined all these characteristics. And this should look familiar to you, because this is designing what we're going to build before we start coding. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. And this part is figuring out what done means. What is an acceptable quality product to ship? It's the same process. We are going through the same process. Now, once we have this part, at this point, we can actually advertise a specific job. We can write a job ad that doesn't say, Hey, we're a state-of-the-art company that's uh, uh, loved by millions. You will make our clients delighted. Come work for us. We can say, boy, do we have a problem. We need to roll out a design system to 35 products for 3,000 engineers located in 18 different countries. 
if you have done that, or something close to that, we want to talk to you. The other night I was having dinner with the head of design for a large security company. He says, oh, we're rolling out a design system. I said, really? He says, yeah, none of the design systems out there are good enough because we need one that's specific to security. I need someone who understands security. That's cool. What does your job ad say? Job ad says, looking for a best of class designers who can come work for a company that secures the world. Join us. Does it say anything about design systems? No. Does it talk anything about the challenges of having a design system specific to security? No. How the candidates you get it? Pretty bland. Yeah. By actually advertising the specific job, we are building, as far as we know, the first design system that is specifically for security applications. Here are some of the challenges we're running into. Would you like to help us solve these challenges? It would be awesome. Come talk to us. You know what you can do on a job ad like that? You can add a sentence to the bottom. It says, along with your resume and your portfolio, if you have it. If you don't, that's okay. Send us two paragraphs about the best design system you ever rolled out. We want to hear what you've done. So now, every application is coming in with these two paragraphs that describe the thing you are looking for. It's way more interesting than their resume and their portfolio, which may not have bothered to put design system in anywhere because they didn't think it was a big deal, but when they start talking about it, it's a big deal. And yeah, you'll get people who don't fill that out. You know what you do? You email them back and you say, hey, can you send me two paragraphs about the best design system you ever did? I really want to know what it is. If they don't have one, okay, that's fine. They're probably not going to score well in your assessment. But if they do, they're the first people you want to talk to. Which brings me to the last hiring technique, which is to collect comparable experiments. Right. Instead of asking people, What's your process? Oh my God, I hate that question. What is your process? I can tell you what all of your processes are. You start with thinking about the user. You're going to empathize. You empathize for exactly six and a half weeks, and you stop empathizing. <laughs> <laughs> Then you move into your design phase. That's 27.2 days. This is crazy stuff. Oh my God. I don't know why we ask candidates what their process is. It's not like we're going to let them use it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, we're barely going to let them use our process. <laughs> That's not a useful question. If you want to know what their, use, their process is, ask them what their process was. Take apart a project. Tell me about the design system you rolled out. Who came up with the idea of rolling out a design system? Was that your idea or did you get an assignment? What did you know about the products when you started? Who did you talk to about this? How did you figure out what the scale of it would be? Did you start with another design system and then Uh, uh, munch it to be like yours, or did you go from scratch? If you decided to go from scratch, why did you make that choice when there are so many design systems out there? How did you make decisions? What was the most complicated decision you had to make? What was the decision you kept going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on until you shipped something? What was the decision you hated the outcome of? How did you deal with that? Right? You can spend a tremendous amount of time diving into specific questions, and these things turn out to be key. 
This is the process. We don't care what imaginary philosophical process they have. What we want to know about is how did they ship every product? How is what you did on this design different from what you did on that design? Why was it different? What made it different? Nobody has a process. Everybody gets stuff shipped by whatever it takes to get it shipped. And sometimes we compromise. And understanding where those compromises come from, that's way more interesting than understanding some philosophy of a process that none of us will ever use. But seriously, I actually do empathize for only six weeks, and then I stop. <laughs> right now, I'm between empathizing. <laughs> I'm going to start empathizing again in late March. <laughs> it's good to know what your empathy cycles are. <laughs> There's an app to tell you when it's coming up. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was designed by people who didn't have empathy, so... <laughs> Make an offer. 
And if you're in Seattle, you better damn do it in three days. <laughs> Boston's not a whole lot different. The key to delivering competitive products is to hire better than your competitors. That's what we've learned. <clears throat> Uh, we have taken all of this, all the stuff that uh, uh, I've learned about hiring over the years, and we've packaged it in a bunch of online videos that also come with uh, uh, online interactive uh, office hours uh, in something called HiringMasterclass.com. So if you are a hiring manager, or your team is hiring and you would like to know more about each of these things that I talked about tonight, the details in there, so I would check that out. Uh, this is part of a bigger effort that we have on strategy. We talk to teams about the strategy of building out their UX departments and, and growing design within their organization. And so we've collected 130 different strategies a bunch of them are around hiring, but a bunch of them are around many other types of uh, uh, user experience uh, aspects, communicating vision, bringing research into the organization, all of these things. We talk about this uh, uh, in our two-day workshop where you actually end up choosing the strategies that work best for your organization as a playbook and bring it home and start acting on it. Uh, and the next one that we have is in uh, uh, February in Chattanooga. Uh, we will have uh, another one in April after that. Uh, we're also, this year, we are uh, uh, going to have workshops in uh, London, Manchester, England, and uh, Hamburg, Germany. Of, uh, uh, which is very exciting for us. Um, you should come to Manchester. It's just like Waltham. <laughs> <laughs> feels, feels almost identical. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so that's that. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is the school that we have in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, called Center Center. Uh, it's a, uh, a two-year program. Our first students just graduated. It, uh, they are now uh, industry-ready UX designers. And we know this because even though they graduated in October, within six weeks, everybody who graduated had a job. Uh, we have one student who's still waiting to fledge uh, uh, from the nest. She, uh, 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 she was delayed due to a death in the family, but uh, she has just this week gone off to do her residency, and uh, she comes on the market in early March. Um, uh, but all the other students have their work lined up. If you are interested in hiring her or in future students, uh, uh, come talk to me. It's a, a very uh, intense program. We create students within a amazing broken comb profile, and we work with them to hone their design skills. Uh, we are going to start our second cohort uh, this year, and right now we are raising the last of the, the $400,000 that we have to raise for that. We need just a, another 98, uh, 198000 or so. Um, and uh, centercenter.com slash donate. This is money that goes into a student loan fund. It's a nonprofit fund that the students borrow against so that they can afford to live, to live in Chattanooga for two years. And we do it as a loan instead of a scholarship because they're getting good jobs and their jobs are going to pay well. And so uh, they are able to, when they make payments back, actually send the next student into the program. 
So it keeps rejuvenating itself. In fact, the reason that we've already got $200,000 is because our first cohort of students have paid back a major amount of their loans already. And we also got a big gift from Capital One, very much Capital One. Um, and so that, that's allowed us to get started. If you would like to be involved with this, you can talk to me or go to centercenter.com slash donate. And then finally, uh, if you're interested in this uh, or anything to do with UX strategy, you can go and check out uh, UIE.com where we uh, have all sorts of articles and resources. We have our All You Can Learn uh, video library, which has 360 seminars of, uh, on various aspects of user experience, uh, everything from accessibility to uh, uh, service design to uh, interaction design to leadership. Uh, you can go there. You can also, uh, uh, if you work in design and we're not connected on the LinkedIn, please connect to me on LinkedIn. You can use that email address to find me there. And then finally, you can follow me on the Twitters at that JM School, where I tweet about design, design strategy, design education, uh, and the amazing customer service habits of the airline industry. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, one of the things about my Twitter account is that every month or so, I tweet out a request for open jobs. So if you are a company that's hiring and you have job descriptions online, uh, go to my Twitter account and you'll see as the pinned tweet the most recent request. And all you do is reply to that tweet with a link to the job post and where the job is. And people are telling me that they get applicants, and several people have told me they've hired applicants that have come through tweets. It's got to be the most ridiculous way to post a job in the universe. But apparently it's working. Uh, that's how bad our job market is right now. Um, so, uh, feel free to do that. As soon as I see it, I'll just retweet it to my 91,000 followers, um, uh, of which I think about 89,000 of them are actually Russian bots. So, uh, uh, that's 2,000 solid designers you'll have access to, I guess. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, so, that's what I came to talk to you about. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. experienced by designers and developers who have more gray hair than otherwise. I'm wondering how it, it uh, fits with this process. You know, because we find an awful lot of developers who've got a lot of their resume because they've been around for a while, but hardly get the callbacks because of the amount that's there or the view of the gray hair or what they, or think somebody thinking what the expense might be. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts on that is that that's, that's a way that we sabotage ourselves all the time, right? Is by somehow perceive, perceiving that people with a lot of experience have that data, experience data. Because that team has not sat down and said, what exactly is the evidence we need to collect in order to know if this person can do the job? In many cases, that evidence is there. One of the nice things about putting the job, the, the, the details in the job ad of what you're looking for is you can specifically say, please tell us everything about this. In fact, uh, uh, that allows us to, to look at candidates uh, from underrepresented groups like people who are older, like women, like people of color. These are all folks who in the tech community traditionally are underrepresented based, uh, uh, versus their standard uh, proportion of the general population. Uh, uh, this allows us to, to work to that end. And in fact, if we are actively working on diversity, we can, we can even counter. Right? So for example, uh, while you, you cannot specifically uh, uh, hire for race or uh, 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 for gender or even age, because that's, that's against the law, what you can do is change the order in which you consider, particularly if it looks at those underrepresented communities who 
first. Uh, at the White House, we had to give uh, preference to, to something. Uh, there was a rule called veterans' preference. So we had to give preference to any veteran for any position that was open. It's a, it's a rule across the government, the federal government. Veterans get first choice on every job. And it's, it's a very fantastic rule. So we had people designate that they were veterans. And if so, when we were sorting the order in which we would screen, we would screen for those folks first. The folks who had the highest points would then come in. We didn't have to lower our standards. We, in fact, had very high standards, uh, which we gave everybody. But the first folks who came through uh, would be the ones we consider. And because we ordered them properly. So you can, you, can, you can make sure that you get those underrepresented communities in that regard. And by having a very concrete definition, which doesn't say, well, they can't be too experienced, that, that, that is really key. Now, the one exception to that rule is I mentioned that there's that one criteria that we give a five to, the distinguished criteria. And we might decide that we don't want someone with too many fives. If someone is going around the world teaching about design systems and uh, 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 has written three books on the topic and is a world-renowned expert, are they going to want to work on this two, three-year project with us and just do this and not go around the world anymore and not do that? Now, they might. They might want a case study for future work. They might be tired of traveling. There are lots of reasons why they might decide to go in-house right now. But that's a red flag, right? And we can, if we have somebody who is overqualified, that could be a problem. So we want to look at that. But that, that overqualification criteria is very rare. Almost always, we just want someone who can do the job. And by having a strong definition of what that means, we get rid of the bias that goes against ageism, that goes against race, that goes against gender, sexual preference, all the things that right now we are, we are unfortunately a little too guilty of. Uh, where, oh, there's my. Uh, in the absence of the entire hiring marketplace to be gone, the practices that you're endorsing, um, what would you suggest that those of us in the marketplace who are looking for these positions do differently to distinguish ourselves, or at least to, to get better informed about what we think those organizations really need? So, so there's a great question. The, the, uh, thank you very much for it. The, the key thing about uh, the way you can use this to, hop, to, to get attention is to focus on the message of comparable experience. You can uh, reach out as best you can. Now, some companies make this very difficult because they're actually, for some reason, thinking that letting potential candidates talk to hiring managers is a distraction. This is because we often treat hiring as tangential to our day job, and therefore not what we're supposed to be spending our time on, when in fact, for a good manager, it is the most important job they have. So what you want to do is you want to be able to reach out to those managers. So this is where your network comes in. This is where coming to events like this, there were seven different job positions that people raised their hand and said we have something. Going up and meeting those folks and say, tell me about the job. Tell me what this person will do. Really sort of getting that there. And then when you're writing your cover letter, when you're sending in your resume, make sure it talks to that to get that screen. And then when you're in the screen, talk to that. And you may have to ask some more clarifying questions and say, what is it you're, you're really looking for this person? What will make this person succeed? And you can ask the question of the thank you note in a different way. You can say, hey, imagine this person has been there a year. What will you be happy that they've accomplished? And, and then talk to that. One of the problems we have is that a lot of people treat hiring as if the candidate is trying to con us into getting the job. And if you've got a good hiring process, it's impossible for them to con you, right? If someone can answer all those questions about rolling out a design system that I had talked about, they can answer every single one of them perfectly, and they've never actually done it, 
Hire them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably fine. <laughs> No one's trying to con you into a job to roll out a design system in a highly political environment where everyone is going to be out for their next. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And, and so we don't have to worry about that. But we, you know, we refuse to tell people what, anything about the job because they might trick us into hiring. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Right? So the good managers, the smart managers, are happy to talk to people about the job and to, to make it more of a conversation. Well, I did this. Can I tell you about the thing I did? Can I tell you about the design system right? You can tell me if that's the sort of thing you're looking for. Because if that's the sort of thing you're looking for, we can have a conversation. And that's really key and really sort of surface your comparable experience. But that means you have to figure out what they're looking for, which means they have to know what they're looking for. And frankly, the companies where they don't know what they're looking for, they're probably not great places to work right now. Because they don't know how to tell if someone's doing a good job. Okay. All right, Jared, thank you so much. Um, it was You're a great, talk, great talk tonight. Um, I remember early on in my career, you bought me chicken fingers at a New Hampshire, New Hampshire USPA thing, and it was like meeting Elvis. So, <laughs> did I have like a big club of chicken fingers? Did I have a we did. You bought them for us. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to. I love eating my chicken fingers. I'm telling you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about a behavior that I've seen um, occasionally with, with UX teams, and. Um, I don't know if I describe it as sort of a not invented here thing or like a, having a, the perfect be the enemy of the good, but I've noticed that with, uh, along with UX designers and UX design teams, when they look at candidates' portfolios, that they devolve into this like feral bunch of like violent Vikings. They're just like, they're like, that is terrible! And nothing pleases them. And I was wondering if, if you've experienced that and why is that happening? <gasps> I was sitting next to a, head, a, a, a design leader. We were going through portfolios of candidates. And the design leader says, uh, his portfolio's on Wix. Never hire someone whose portfolio's on Wix. <laughs> Why? Well, if they were worth their salt, they, you know, they, they would have coded their own. I want someone who can code their own. Like, there's nothing in this job profile that says that you wanted them to code. Where did that requirement come from? Well, good designers code. We're not talking about good designers, whatever the hell that means, versus, you know, evil designers. Um, um, actually, I think the evil designers are better coders. Um, um, we're talking about someone who can do this job. Do we need to change the requirements to say that they can code? And just because they implemented on Wix doesn't mean they can't code. Maybe not only can they code, but they are also very good with their time, and their portfolio shouldn't be the thing they spend their time coding, right? What the, where are you getting any of this from? And, 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 and that's the problem. Uh, and similarly, any sort of opinions of a portfolio that aren't specifically in that criteria, that's problematic. In fact, I tell teams not to bother to look in the portfolio until they've talked to the candidate multiple times. And then they can have the candidate walk through the portfolio. If they're going to look at the portfolio at all, the question should be, is there anything in your portfolio that's specific to this job? And if there's not, Ignore the portfolio. It's not good, it's not bad, it doesn't matter. Because it's not going to help you get comparable experience evidence. And so that's, that's the key thing, right? So people who, who spend a lot of time on portfolio reviews, and I, I know there are companies where you cannot apply if you do not have a portfolio. That's a huge mistake. Because there are a lot of really good, particularly passive candidates, 
who have never had a portfolio because every time they're available, they're snapped up and they never needed a portfolio. If you never need a portfolio, why would you create one? And I've had hiring managers tell me, well, they're just lazy. Okay, maybe they are lazy, but I don't see lazy <laughs> in your criteria either. So, you know, on the other hand, they're producing great work for some other person, and you don't have them on your team. Why is that? Right? And, you know, are you sure that's laziness, or are you just sure, that, you know, it's, it's not good, you know. Well, I have time on my portfolio. I'm thinking, okay, you're not busy enough. <laughs> so. Last question in the middle. Hi, you mentioned before. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned before about the job description saying, you know, we have this problem and this is what we need to do and how can you help us? And, and that would be a fantastic job ahead to introduce the, the candidates to the position. I've been in situations where senior management would kill me if I posted that. Because they feel like the company's, you, you're airing dirty laundry in public. By, by admitting the problems, by pointing out where your weaknesses are, if that has something to do with competitors, etc. Have you ever encountered that kind of thing where they, they specifically want the job description to be more vague? Yes, yes, that does happen. Uh, there's two, there's a couple of, of answers. That's an excellent question, thank you. Uh, uh, there, there, there is a, a, a couple of things here to consider. First, you don't have to have one job ad. You can have multiple job ads. You can have the one that goes up on the public website, right, that goes into Indeed.com. That's fine, because the people who come through Indeed aren't that great anyway. Right? I mean, seriously, it, 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 it's not that... It's not that uh, uh, they as individuals are bad people. It's that those are the systems that people apply to every open job that looks vaguely like it, and they're probably not going to score very high, right? And so, so you can put that out there because it's not going to get you what you want to begin with. But if you are a good hiring manager, you are making contacts all the time. You are finding out who is doing what. Right? If you really want to do passive uh, rec recruitment of passive candidates, what you need to do to do recruitment of passive candidates, uh, if you're rolling out a massive design system in the next year or so, you need to go find out who's working on design systems in the Boston area. You know, is there a design system meetup? You need to start showing up at these things. You need to start hearing who's talking, who's asking the smart questions. You need to meet these people up. You need to find out what they're doing. So that the moment that position comes live, you can send them your, an email that actually talks about the work. Just, or say, hey, I've got a job thing that I think you're going to be interested in. It's like what we talked about at the meetup. Can we have coffee? I can't put it in writing. Right? And then you're going to have that. And if your upper management is so paranoid that you are not allowed to explain any aspect of the job to the candidate before they actually started the company, I would look for work. <laughs> so, and those places exist. I have seen those companies where it's like, no, no, we put everybody under triple NDA uh, and we still don't tell them anything. <laughs> and because uh, uh, and you're not going to get great candidates. There's nobody who's going to say, yes, I want to jump through all these bureaucratic hoops with these crazy-ass non-disclosure agreements to find out that this actually has nothing to do with my experience. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the key. So I, I would start there, and I would, I would have multiple... Uh, job ads. One that you hand out to people who are in your network, the other one you post. But the other thing that I would do is I would start mounting a campaign. I would start with collecting all the job ads from your competitors and say, these are the people we are competing against. They are listing the exact same jobs as us. We are going to get their dregs. <laughs> what we need to do is get to the next level. 
And if you let me actually put the challenge out there, and you can put it in positive terms, you don't have to air it as dirty laundry. Right? You can say, oh my God, are we fucked? <laughs> right? That isn't how I would start the ad. <laughs> right? Instead, I would start the ad with, we're doing stuff nobody else is doing. Here's what I can tell you about it. It involves design systems. It involves the fact that we are a security company. It involves some challenges that if you pay attention to the world of design systems, you will see that no one else is dealing with this. We are looking for someone who loves challenges. We'd be very happy to have an informational phone call to see if you are the right person. Contact us. That would be gold. Because you would get people who are really awesome. And you can screen them, right? You say, I'd like the informational call. Okay, can you tell me a story about the design system you've rolled out that you're most proud of? And call them the order of most interesting to least interesting. And go from there. So there's, there are all sorts of magical ways to get past this. But yeah, you have to be creative. It's a design problem. We have to treat it like design. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Go enjoy your experience.